to light. A cry for help. Gazan struggle to survive as famine washes over the entire region. With electricity sparse, hospitals bear the brunt of the impact, causing the loss of several hundreds more. International outrage. The gang rape and assault of foreign citizens in India causes the uproar of communities across the globe. A crackdown on the crime being initiated internationally. Two sessions begin. China's top political advisory body starts its annual session. The meeting kicks off with an unprecedented change, opting out of a premier's address. And feline feats. Take a look at what this sneaky cat has dragged in. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Hello and good evening. You're joining us on World News. Hope you have had a weekend full of rest and relaxation and that you're ready to tackle the rest of this week. Well, with the end of Monday closing in, here's a rundown of all the key global events that took place since we last joined you. Hospitals in northern Gaza are now struggling to cope with acute malnutrition and dehydration cases without electricity and with intensive care units relying solely on solar energy. At least 15 children in northern Gaza died of malnutrition in recent days. This is according to health authorities in the Hamas-run enclave. UN health authorities have also said that Gaza is on the brink of famine as aid deliveries into the enclosed enclave have rapidly decreased and Palestinians struggle to find food. In this hospital in Gaza, staff are struggling to keep the lights on and babies alive. Amid regular blackouts in the enclave, the facility is relying on solar power to stay afloat. The Hamas-run health ministry says at the Kamal Adwan hospital in northern Gaza, at least 15 children have died of malnutrition and dehydration in recent days. Authorities worry the numbers could rise. <laughs> In northern Gaza, where the UN is warning that famine is imminent, people are desperate. It's been nearly impossible to get aid in. Behind the scenes, negotiations for a truce continue. Israel wants Hamas to release hostages taken last October. Hamas says an agreement could be cemented within the next 24 to 48 hours if Israel agrees to return displaced Palestinians to northern Gaza and increase humanitarian aid. It's not clear if Israel will accept those terms. We're over in our region now as Indian police have detained three men and are searching for four others accused of attacking two tourists and gang raping a woman involved. The superintendent of police in Dumka in eastern India has said the police found the couple who are Spanish citizens on a roadside looking like they had suffered a major beating. The couple, who had been travelling by motorcycle from the state of West Bengal to neighbouring Nepal, were found late Friday by police officers on patrol. They were taken to hospital where the woman told the doctor she had been raped. Police know the identities of the wanted suspects and have formed a special investigative team. It is unclear whether the three arrested suspects have legal representation. Police have not disclosed the names nor nationalities of the couple. The arrest comes after a travel vlogger couple on Saturday posted on their Instagram account that they held knives to our throats during an attack in India. The couple posts in Spanish and the woman says on her Instagram page that she's Brazilian. On the Instagram story, the woman showed bruises on her face, saying this is what my face looks like, but it isn't what hurts the most. I thought I was going to die. The Spanish foreign ministry said it was sending staff to the area and had been in touch with authorities, while its Brazilian counterpart said it had sought contact with the woman, who is Spanish-Brazilian dual citizen through its embassy in New Delhi and was available to offer assistance. <laughs> Pakistan's newly formed parliament elected Shabazz Sharif as prime minister for a second time running. This comes three weeks after uncertain national elections caused delays in the formation of a coalition government. Sharif had secured 201 votes, a majority, but his victory was controversial. It was met with loud protests from the Sunni Ittihad Council party, backed by jailed former prime minister Imran Khan. Lawmakers loyal to Khan banked on their desks and chanted opposition slogans. They alleged Shabazz came to power through electoral rigging and called for the release of Khan, 
who was sentenced to 10 years in jail in a case for leaking state secrets. On February 8th, the South Asian country voted in an election marked by a mobile internet shutdown, arrests and violence in its build-up. The unusually delayed results triggered accusations by critics that the vote was rigged. Shabazz now returns to the role he held until August last year, when Parliament was dissolved ahead of February 8th election and a caretaker government took over. Over in China, the country's top political advisory body has started its annual session in Beijing. President Xi Jinping, also the General Secretary of the Communist Party of China and other Chinese leaders attended the opening meeting of the second session of the 14th National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, or the CPPCC, at the Great Hall of the People. Surprisingly, China's Premier Li Chang will not hold a news conference after the close of this year's annual parliamentary meeting. Since 1993, the Premier's international news conference held after the conclusion of the annual parliamentary meeting has become a regular and institutionalized event. The National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference kicks off on Monday, with the National People's Congress opening on Tuesday, as China begins its largest political event of the year, known as the Two Sessions. This also means that its Congress will begin to gauge the direction of state affairs under President Xi Jinping, who has entered the second year of his third term in office. At the center of attention at this year's two sessions will be China's economy and its economic growth target for this year. Amid concerns over deflation and the slumping real estate market, global investment institutions are predicting China's economic growth rate this year to be at the 4% range. However, looking ahead, Beijing has boasted a strong resilience, great potential, and ample vitality, with many predicting that China will propose a growth target of 5%. There will also be focus on who Beijing will name as their next top diplomat. According to analysts, the current head of the Chinese Communist Party's International Liaison Department, Liu Jinchao, is being considered as the person to replace Wang Yi as foreign minister. Pundits say with the U.S. presidential election coming up in November and no telling who will be sitting in the Oval Office, China is playing it cautious as Liu is considered to have a moderate view on the U.S. Attention will also be on what kind of message will be communicated on the Taiwan issue and whether this year's two sessions will allow for a tighter grip on power for President Xi. Let's go for a short commercial break. We'll be back with more Clean Global Stories right after this. Stay tuned. And on the road to the White House tonight, the final sprint to Super Tuesday is underway. With Nikki Haley campaigning in Vermont and Maine, two of the 15 states set to vote on Tuesday. It comes after another sweep for former President Donald Trump, who notched caucus wins in Idaho and Missouri this weekend. What a great crowd. Thank you. The final sprint to Super Tuesday. Now let's talk about what you need to do on Tuesday. And what could be Nikki Haley's final stand. Yes, I'm going to keep on fighting. I need you to go Tuesday and vote. Next up, as you know, Super Tuesday. Now barreling into Tuesday with his mind already on a general election rematch. And this November, Virginia is going to tell crooked Joe Biden, you're fired, you're fired, get out of here. And glancing blows at his sole GOP rival, Haley. You know who Bird Brand is, right, Nikki? Haley, for her part, reversing course, now saying she may not keep a pledge she took to support the eventual Republican nominee. And Trump saying at his rally he doesn't want moderate Republican voters in his party. We're getting rid of the Romneys of the world. But Trump Venezuela. also stumbling at times. Did you just see Maduro? Venezuela. Mispronouncing Venezuela and seeming to say Barack Obama is the current president, not Biden. And Putin, you know, has so little respect for Obama that he... Still, Super Tuesday all but sure to install Trump as his party's standard bearer once more.
Meanwhile, Nikki Haley has surprisingly defeated Donald Trump in the Republican primary in Washington, D.C. A round of overdue applause, I guess. This is her first victory over the former president in the 2024 campaign to become the Republican presidential candidate. She lost in South Carolina, her home state, but she is the first woman to win a Republican primary in U.S. history. Trump, however, has a huge lead over Haley and is likely to face Joe Biden in the November elections. Haley will receive all 19 Republicans. Republican delegates who were up for grabs in Washington, D.C., giving her 43 delegates nationwide, well behind Trump's 247 number. Haley, a former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., won 62.9 percent of the vote to Trump's 33.2 percent. It's seen as a largely symbolic win as the capital is a heavily Democrat-leaning jurisdiction, with only about 23,000 registered Republicans in the city. The Trump campaign, however, was quick to dismiss Haley's win, calling her the Queen of the Swamp. Over now on updates on the Ukraine war, a series of explosions have rocked Crimea after a reported Ukrainian drone attack on the peninsula. Video shows a blast allegedly near a fuel depot in the southeastern city of Fedyosura. Russian officials said 38 drones had been shot down. The Kerch Bridge, which connects Crimea with Russia, was also temporarily closed. For more on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Sandapini Dugandralev from Kursk in Russia. Yes, Anuradi. The attack comes as Ukraine continues to urge allies to boost armed supplies. Russian troops have recently made gains in Ukraine as Q struggles to sustain its forces with Western-made arms. Russia has not reported any damage from the latest attack on Crimea, although eyewitnesses have reported windows shaking and car alarms going off. Q has not confirmed its forces were involved. Russian forces have launched thousands of Iranian-made drones at Ukraine targets since they invaded the country more than two years ago. In retaliation, Ukraine has targeted Russian sites, notably oil facilities. On Saturday, a drone struck a residential building in St. Petersburg, Russia's second largest city. About 100 people were evacuated and there were no reports of casualties. With its air bases, troop concentrations, training grounds and the Black Sea Fleet, Crimea has been a key target for the Ukrainians. At one point last year, it was thought that it intended uh, to launch a full-scale attack to retake the peninsula. Back to you, Radi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Sandra Pinidugarala from Kursk in Russia. We're moving over to France now, where French lawmakers are set to hold a final vote on inscribing abortion into the Constitution, a move widely expected to pass to the joy of women's rights groups and to the disappointment from pro-life associations. French President Emmanuel Macron also convened a special Congress of National Assembly representatives and senators in Versailles after both houses of parliament approved to enshrine the guaranteed freedom to abortion into its Constitution. If the proposition garners a three-fifth majority in the Special Congress, France will become the world's first nation to constitutionalize abortion. Women have had a legal right to abortion in France since the law was adopted in 1974. The law has been updated several times since with the latest modification in February 2022, extending access to abortion to 14 weeks of pregnancy from 12. Far-left lawmaker Mathilde Pernod put forward the bill at the National Assembly, which voted to pass it in November 2022. The French Senate also voted in favour of the text. The move followed a US Supreme Court decision that reversed Roe v. Wade ruling that recognised women's constitutional right to abortion and opened the door to states to ban the procedure. Proponents and supporters of the bill have said that the abortion is a fundamental right and a guaranteed freedom that must be included in the constitution. This week will mark a decade since Malaysia Airlines flight MH370 had disappeared. Family members of missing passengers were hopeful on Sunday that a new search for the plane may finally shed light on one of the world's greatest aviation mysteries. Malaysia's Transport Minister Anthony Loke says his government is pushing for a new attempt to find the Boeing 777, which disappeared with 227 passengers and 12 crew on board while travelling from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing in 2014. As I've mentioned, numerous times, as far as Malaysian government, government is concerned, we are committed to that search and the search must go on. 
At a remembrance event in the city of Subang Jaya, Lok said Malaysia had invited the U.S. seabed exploration company called Ocean Infinity to discuss a new search proposal after two previous attempts to find the plane failed. A two-year, $130 million underwater search by Malaysia, China and Australia came to an end in January 2017. The following year, Malaysia had engaged Ocean Infinity for a search in the Southern Indian Ocean offering up to $70 million if the plane was found. Over the years, debris, some confirmed and some believed to be from the aircraft, have washed up on the shores of Africa and islands across the Indian Ocean, some of which were on display at Sunday's Remembrance. VPR Northern, whose wife was on board, is hopeful the latest proposal will uncover something new. Officials say once Malaysia's cabinet approves Ocean Infinity's proposal, it will talk to Australia about working together to resume the search. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. No matter whether you think it's cute or creepy, the skeleton panda sea squirt is one of Japan's newest species. Its distinctive skeleton-like body structure and black spots that mimic a pandas have made it popular with divers visiting the Japanese island of Kuejima ever since images of it were posted online. After its debut online, Japanese netizens quickly coined a name for it, Gaikotsu Panda Hoya, literally Japanese for skeleton panda sea squirt. You probably aren't sure what you're looking at right now. Is it a fish? An eel? The ghost of aquarium inhabitants past? This is the skeleton panda sea squirt, and it's a species that's been newly identified in Japan. It kind of gives off Jack Skellington vibes. There are few who deny it. What I do, I am the best. Though someone else saw a cuddly panda. And it does live in the sea, so skeleton panda sea squirt it is. The unusual creatures are tiny, measuring about two centimeters or about three quarters of an inch long. Scuba divers around the Japanese coast began posting pictures of the sea squirts online around 2017. The pics caught the attention of researchers from the University of Hokkaido, who studied and have just released a paper on them. The skeleton panda sea squirt does have a real name, and like most animals, it's in Latin, Clavolina ossipandae. Clavolina, which means little bottle, and ossipandae to refer to its slight resemblance to the panda. And finally tonight, it's a cat burglar, literally. Every night, this kitty named Jordan strolled his neighborhood in Pennsylvania in search of shoes. It's Jordan's catch for the day almost every day. Jordan's owner and her son set up cameras and put a GPS tracking device on him to see where he was finding so many shoes night after night. He brings one and goes back for the second one either that night or a different day. They started a Facebook group to return the over 80 shoes to their rightful owners. And apparently, he loves to admire his shoe collection. A sassy little shoe snatcher is more than welcome in my backyard. That's feline persuasion for you. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again tomorrow with more updates on the happenings of the world. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.